Well, good morning, Keithley. Good morning, Josh. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Looking yeah. forward to the discussion. Um, maybe we could do some brief introductions and before we jump right in. Absolutely. Go ahead. All right. Happy to start. Uh, my name is Josh DiVincenzo. I am a, the Assistant Director of Education and Training at the National Center uh, for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University's Climate School, as well as an adjunct lecturer where a lot of my interests and research focus and teaching revolves around uh, disaster preparedness, response, recovery, adaptation, mitigation, uh, and many of those themes uh, focusing primarily on how people think about climate change mm -hmm. and the impact. So really looking forward to the discussion. Excellent. Um, my name is Keith Lee Woolward, and I'm the new associate director of the uh, Masters in History and Literature offered here at Columbia's uh, Global Center in Paris. Uh, the program is in history and literature, so I'm coming to uh, this discussion from a literary, cultural, and historical studies background. Uh, that is actually my year of training, so I work on a lot of the um, history, literature, cultural forms of expression of Africa and the Caribbean. Um, so this is going to be, I think, a really interesting conversation around how do we approach these issues from these very different perspectives. Excellent. We're well, looking forward to it. I know um, uh, briefly we talked uh, at lunch the other day around mm -hmm. kind of your own personal experiences and if you don't mind kind of starting off there and maybe we can build from uh, that experience around what you've seen in terms of changes with the built environment historical context and maybe we can frame it into um, some of the comp complexities associated with how we make these decisions and uh, how we're planning for the future for these climate impacts. Mm -hmm. Well, I think probably the most important um, element here is biography and geography. Mm -hmm. um, I'm originally from St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, St. Kitts and Nevis is in the chain of islands that constitute the Lesser Antilles. Um, so if you see Puerto Rico, there's the set of islands that go south um, uh, into the greater um, Antilles. Uh, former colony of Britain, we gained independence in 1983. Um, so there is that biography aspect and the geography aspect. The other aspect of the geography as well is that St. Kitts and Nevis is located in what is commonly referred to as Hurricane Alley. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that is part of growing up in the Caribbean region is you always have to be thinking about the hurricane season. So as we're getting into the end of May, beginning of June, people start you know, getting ready for the hurricane season in terms of preparedness, etc. Uh, the intensity of the season tends to be end of August going into early October. So there's a bit of a reprieve in the summer, but it's always something that's in the that's in the back of the mind. Um, so th that biography and that geography, I think, sort of frames kind of where our discussions are going to go. Excellent. And I actually think it's really fascinating that you brought up the biography component, because one of the things that we're looking at when we're trying to engage the whole person in how mm -hmm. to prepare themselves, uh, mm -hmm. both uh, externally, internally for the impacts of climate change is that notion that with every single type of climate literacy, education, preparedness campaign, each individual is bringing with them their biography, this repository Absolutely. of memories, Absolutely. histories. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, how has that impacted kind of your uh, into, um, perceptions of climate? And well, so, I mean, this is part of what spurred our initial conversation. Yeah. One of the things that I think is is really important is that there, I mean, I fundamentally believe that there's there, there's a body of knowledge that is that is um, anthropological um, that gets passed down from generation to generation, right? Mm -hmm. So if we if we take for example um, a basic notion of technology, um, which is one of the ways that we think about building resistance um, in just everyday lives, but particularly in terms of climate change and disaster preparedness, um, we're applying um, scientific knowledge to solve problems, whether it's, whether it's disaster preparedness problems or um, global climate change problems. But we often forget that there is this anthropological aspect um, to technology. Uh, and by that, I mean this notion that there's a body of knowledge that a people share that gets passed on from generation to generations. Uh, and the, I mean, the example I often use is before we got to really great apps that could predict the weather, mm -hmm. uh, people had to learn how to read natural phenomena to understand things like hurricanes were actually coming. Mm -hmm. um, so you understood how to pay attention to wind movements. You understood how to pay attention to animal movements, so flights of birds, for example, uh, or even looking at uh, the ocean. Uh, for signs that something was that something was coming, uh, and that knowledge was passed on from generation to generation. And I think we, as we get more technologically advanced, we're moving away, I believe, mm -hmm. from some of those more intuitive interactions that human beings would have with their with their environment. Um, 
and and this of course shows up in in a number of different aspects. One of the things we talked about at lunch was the fact that in the 1970s across much of the Caribbean region, there was a conversation about building resilience, but also thinking about human progress. And resilience and progress meant that instead of having to suffer damage from a hurricane season and you have to rebuild afterwards, Mm -hmm. which anthropologically was embedded in the way people live on islands, there was an idea of, well, why don't we just build concrete structures? Concrete structures are more uh, more stable, more resistant um, to weather phenomenon, etc. And so there was a shift away from local traditional construction out of stone and wood uh, to more concrete uh, and blocks. Um, and what that's done, it's that it's shifted this anthropological knowledge I was talking about earlier, mm-hmm. where the idea of recuperation and rebuilding that would be a part of every hurricane season two generations on i think we've we've lost some of that resilience um but one of the other things that's happening as well is that concrete retains heat Mm -hmm. and so all of these wonderful concrete structures that are now resistant to hurricanes are now creating these like mini heat domes that capture and store heat which makes it actually quite uninhabitable to be in some of these houses during the summer months when it's just too hot to be inside. Um, so again, this, th- those are a couple of examples of some of the ways that this biographical, anthropological sort of engagement with the environment is, is useful. And it's almost a third dimension there as well as what, when you're describing, uh, we often refer to climate as the, cl- um, the hazard multiplier or the mm-hmm. climate multiplier. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, if uh, some of our built environment decisions solve one issue, it's not necessarily the mul- multitude of issues that come with climate. Um, but you did mention there uh, something I want to kind of return back to and just uh, hear a little bit more of your perspective on that is this this idea of resilience. And this is something in the in, in the field we're always kind of debating. Mm-hmm. You know, what does mm-hmm. this actually mm-hmm. mean? Is it, mm-hmm. it what's this definition parameters? Uh, in in from your experience, is kind of uh, combining the biographical and anthropological. Um, where does resilience stand in, in how you define it? I mean, d- this is just me speaking on yeah. a very personal level. I think um, resilience, if understood as eliminating all potential risk, is, I think, a flawed perspective. Right. 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 Um, when I think uh, about uh, my grandparents' generation, again, one of the things that was a part of the way that they lived um, in Hurricane Alley on an island was the fact that there was the risk that you could have damage during a hurricane. This was something that you lived with on an annual basis. And so there was a culture of thinking through what could we recuperate in order to rebuild afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um, We've, I think, lost the capacity to integrate risk as a part of resilience models. So if if resilience is about building um, in such a way that it can survive a hurricane because it's concrete and it's stronger, etc., as you say, there are these there are other attendant problems mm-hmm. uh, in a hurricane where there's a question of air pressure, uh, a concrete structure that is often sealed uh, creates a pressure box in such a way that it can completely explode. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that concrete um, impact of thinking resilience as an elimination of risk, whereas one of the things that's fascinating about older construction. Um, across a number of Caribbean islands, and I'm sure other island chains in the world uh, see this phenomenon, uh, when you are able to construct in stone and wood, uh, there's a way that they react to and are perhaps a bit more malleable um, to questions of pressure, etc. So you may not lose the entire house, you may lose a part of it, but not the entirety. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then once once the hurricane passes by then kicks in the other aspect of that resilience of let's recuperate what we can and let's in a manner that is communal and community driven rebuild Mm -hmm. because this is a part of our way of existing um so what i would say is the fact that you know eliminating risk is probably not valuable um that integrating risk um in the way that perhaps two or three generations ago uh, people had a way of dealing with it may actually be um, an opportunity to return to the past for being prepared for the future. <laughs> Which is such an interesting dynamic, and it's almost as though um, the way you're describing it is something that is um, 
kind of a precursor of what we're anticipating, of course, in the mm-hmm. United States, if it doesn't already exist, it's just we haven't come to, to terms with it, is mm-hmm. that you have risk as a constant. It's this way of life that's embedded right. where uh, currently, um, you know, even how we talk about disasters, usually a linear continuum mm-hmm. disruptive mm-hmm. event. But uh, a lot of what you're experiencing and what you're describing is more of the cycle. You know, it's it's right. a, it's it's uh, mm-hmm. it's there, and uh, that makes me kind of wonder as well if the, if we understand risk as a constant. And for a long time, we used uh, a very simplified equation for risk. Risk equals hazard times frequency. And in the equation that you're describing, it's a high frequency. Um, you know, you know the hazard as well. So risk is just there. But it makes me kind of question. You know, or want to think through. Um, potentially, you know, if we understand this risk on a, on a regularly occurring basis, mm-hmm. what are some, some of the things that we could have, could do and could have potentially have done to mitigate better or to address these better? And mm-hmm. what do you think some of these barriers might have been? Um, I'm speaking as someone who comes out of um, humanities and social sciences where literature is the, um, is the primary focus um, of much of the work that I do. I mean, human beings tell stories, have always told stories, mm-hmm. and there's a way that we can build and gain knowledge from the way that we talk about who we are and how we exist in the world. Um, this is not to say that um, there isn't value in numbers and equations. Um, the challenge with equations, though, is that it's, a, it's an attempt to simplify the complexity of the of world in which we live. Um, which isn't to say that we should be afraid of complexity. I think actually we need to be able to embrace the fact that there are some elements of human existence in terms of us humans, but humans in the environment in which we live that will be beyond the equation, you know, (laughs) so that uh, perhaps um, thinking about, and I'm thinking about this because I'm, you know, working um, within a university environment is how do we think about um, passing on a set of skills to our students mm-hmm. that are analytical and critical, but also that are able to integrate that there may be some things that will be beyond the reach of the tools that we have. And so the idea is to be flexible, um, mm-hmm. to recalibrate uh, in the moment. Uh, and to work through the fact that, okay, maybe we can start from scratch. As in, like, are we prepared to abandon mm-hmm. <laughs> the equation when the equation really isn't working? <laughs> right. Or the equation is not telling us what we want to see in many ways. You know, right. it's like right. the equation is giving us a very clear output, uh, and then it's the, it's the what comes after, the mm-hmm. calculation mm-hmm. that is mm-hmm. somewhat mm-hmm. challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you were talking a little bit there around kind of abandoning or coming to the realization that maybe that is an option, um, how do we approach that balance? And I, I really want to kind of uh, uh, lean on you for your expertise and kind of balancing kind of the present moment with the historical context, because this is something that we've encountered a lot in our work is um, this balance between long term thinking. Is it always future uh, driven uh, and oftentimes the past gets discounted? Um, how do we become better at, a- at analyzing kind of these historical or temporal um, increments that could be helpful for complexity? Um, again, I work in literature um, and history, and we're often talking about um, the past or even the present to make some um, some suppositions about the future. Mm-hmm. Um, f- for me, I mean, I think um, it is important to recognize and also embrace the value of what the past offers, right? Um, if we go back to this notion of technology, we're now at a phase where um, there were technological advancements that were made a hundred years ago that were at um, the forefront of where human beings were, um, and we're passing beyond some of those technological advances. We're perhaps maybe giving them a second look, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so, from a technology perspective, yes, but I think also too, like. They, I, th- I think there needs to be a real interest, at least in terms of people who are policymakers, et cetera, for thinking about the past, not just, again, from that anthropological human perspective, but thinking about the past in terms of initiatives that were implemented and what was the follow-up, mm-hmm. right? Because um, we often have instances where policies are implemented, but we don't necessarily do the follow-up 10 five years after to sort of get a sense of, ah, maybe, maybe we should have done this differently, etc. Um, I think again about 
um, the sort of imposition of concrete structures as part of the built environment in the Caribbean, um, you built uh, a house that was concrete, it meant that you were able to get a mortgage, it meant that you could get insurance. Um, and so there's a whole banking system, banking and insurance system, mm -hmm. that was built around this idea of progress. And now we're at a point where the sort of secondary impact of that built environment in concrete we're now having to think about, but we also now have to then think about the way that the economy was structured. Yeah. Um, I mean, insurance is also about um, providing um, recourse in the face of risk. Mm -hmm. um, not everything can actually be written into um, an insurance contract. Um, and do we really need an insurance contract for everything? I don't know. Right. Um, that's, again, something I'm putting out there. Um, but certainly an interest in, in the past from a human perspective, but I think also from a poli policy decision perspective is really valuable. Uh, why were decisions made? How were they made? How were they implemented? What pathways did they follow to get there? Uh, maybe we can use different pathways, you know, um, for thinking about who the stakeholders were or weren't um, who were present in, in that past decision making process. Excellent. Yeah, in our line of work, we often call that the after action report. So after mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one of these disasters happen, we have after action reports for almost any significant <clears throat> event. But to your point earlier, it's when do we actually consult back to them or make refinements based on that. And uh, the one thing that we, of course, know is that no two disasters are the same. Exactly. Um, exactly. And those after action reports do hold a ton of value. Um, in terms of kind of the present moment and some of the things that we can be doing better around uh, creating a comprehensive archive because we've seen after action reports, you know, they don't necessarily resonate with everybody, the policymakers. Mm -hmm. No one, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. shouldn't say no one, uh, oftentimes <clears throat> not read, you know, and, and right. in, in those cases, um, do you think there's any other types of strategies or modalities that we could be um, leveraging more to kind of capture the moment just so that, you know, 10, 20 years from now, when others are looking for a historical record of the kind of hazards gone, gone gone awry um what what could we be directing them to better um so i mean local knowledge is always valuable um, right. as much as as much as is possible um forgetting that local knowledge but i mean this is also part of a conversation we were having uh, just earlier about the fact that one of the challenges for me <clears throat> i think is the fact that a lot of institutions geared towards doing some of this work whether we're talking about you know international monetary fund united nations etc also are not representative in the diversity of people within those organizations mm -hmm. um because even at the point of the elaboration of the policy response if there are multiple voices uh, involved in that process um then you don't eliminate the risk of not getting it right entirely but you probably are closer um, to a more adequate solution um, and i'm using adequate as opposed to a right solution because there really isn't right, right. <laughs> <laughs> there really isn't a right solution necessarily um, so i think i think that's one of the that's one of the important areas of um of thinking about who's present in these discussions mm -hmm. and where's where's recruitment happening um in terms of you know the pathways for being involved in a lot of um, policy making doesn't necessarily include um, people from the Caribbean, um, again, the Caribbean and, and as well as many small island developing states are on the forefront of a lot of climate impact right mm -hmm. now. Um, and we've got a pretty good delegation uh, that is at uh, COP right now trying to you know, advocate on behalf of small island developing states. But it's, um, I mean, SIDS, as they're often referred to, um, tend to not have the kind of presence right. in a lot of, um, you know, policy making bodies globally. Um, so, I mean, I think that's 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 one area where um, we can have a greater impact is the who's present in these instances um, for facilitating those conversations. And continuously present, but then also creating it uh, a pathway to make it easy for folks to be present. Because oftentimes mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. know what we'll mm -hmm. see is that we'll do a <clears throat> Uh, call for input or w whatever it might be and it's a one-off instance so right. it, um, right, right, right. on paper it looks like yes we we, mm -hmm. we had folks present from 
uh, different backgrounds, uh, different uh, stakeholder groups. Mm -hmm. However, um, I think one of the things that we can be doing uh, a lot better is just charting a way for continuous involvement, understanding that uh, people are taking time out of their livelihoods, their day to day to mm -hmm. provide the input that we all desperately need to improve a lot of these programs and mm -hmm. policies. So mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's a great point. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the other things I would add to this as well is yeah. perhaps that um, in 2023, it may, be, it may be time for us to think about progress differently. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> you know? <Yeah. laughs> um, that um, maybe in, you know, communities that would be considered uh, traditional um, in terms of their knowledge base and tools and applications of technology, etc., perhaps have um, an inroad into a... Into a um, a kind of harmony with the environment in which they live um, and maybe paying attention to that harmony um, could be useful as opposed to sort of looking at just gaps that technology can fill mm -hmm. um, is it necessary for technology to be involved here um, when there's probably a way that the local community has thought through and provided solutions for certain problematics um, so I mean that that that's a that's a that's a deeper, more philosophical kind of engagement. But and and I'm not saying this as you know as being anti-progress, mm -hmm. uh, but perhaps thinking progress differently may also be a, a very useful uh, positioning to take now. No, a great point, and I think uh, c goes back to a little bit what we were talking about earlier mm -hmm. with knowledge share, knowledge transfer, and. Uh, just equipping uh, communities, but also the policymakers with mm -hmm. some type of common mm -hmm. denominator of, mm -hmm. of the language to use, because oftentimes uh, we'll see, you know, party A, party B, just on a different page, more or less saying the same thing, but don't have the lexicon, right. don't have right. the terminology that each other mm -hmm. are speaking. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that we focus on with climate literacy, and I don't even really like the word climate literacy, if it's more of the climate empowerment piece mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. um, if we can give the foundational concepts of what's going on and, and, and beyond the scientific, as we were talking about earlier, yeah. has to be a merger between scientific and the bio biographical information um, to begin to voice, to share, and then it has to be mutual, you know, so it mm -hmm. can't be... Mm -hmm the one directional of um, policy coming in saying this is the right way to do things, um, but also being able to equip all the conditions possible so that we do have the continuous engagement uh, throughout, which is absolutely takes absolutely. a little bit of that community engagement, some of the education pieces as well, but um, I think that's a, a missing piece that um, everyone involved could probably benefit quite a bit from, so we're really of course, fortunate of to be course, working on that. Of course, of course, of course.